Welcome to our series on concepts in mapping and ablation. This program is going to focus on how to time bipolar and unipolar electrograms in the setting of mapping focal atrial tachycardia. I'm going to give this talk in three parts. When you have a patient with a focal atrial tachycardia, the goal is to find the site of earliest atrial activation and use that site as the target for ablation. Today we have multiple systems that allow high density multi-electrode mapping. These systems allow us to move the catheter around the chamber and continuously acquire the mapping data. In order to do that, these systems have to automatically time each electrogram. They do that by combining information from the bipolar electrogram and the unipolar electrogram. The bipolar electrogram is used to eliminate the far field components of the signal. The unipolar electrogram is actually used to measure the local activation time for each electrode. So the question is, if we have automatic rapid high density mapping, why do we have to know how to select the activation time? Well, the answer is we have to be able to verify the activation time at each site because there will be situations where we will want to change or we have to change the timing of activation. We call that annotation. Annotation is assigning an activation time. The sites that require changing are very often in areas of low voltage and with multiple atrial potentials. Another time that we need to verify the activation time is when we're actually selecting the ablation site. When CARDO was introduced, the very first mapping system was introduced many years ago, a lot of people thought all you had to do was target the center of the early area, the red color. But this almost never worked. The reason is that a very good lesion produces necrosis only about five or six millimeters in diameter. That is about three millimeters from the center of the electrode. And in most patients, the site of earliest activation is not at the center of the red area. For instance, in this patient, earliest atrial activation was recorded at this site, about three millimeters from the edge of where a lesion would have been created. In that case, the RF application can actually raise the temperature at this distance high enough to stop the tissue from functioning, but not to produce necrosis, so that the tachycardia would appear to be eliminated, but would return in a number of hours or days or weeks and be just as frequent and just as rapid as it was before. So one error of targeting close to the site uh, that you have to ablate is that you may only stun the myocardium and not kill it. So it's important to be able to look at the points in the area where you think the site of earliest activation is and to be able to use good criteria that we're going to talk about to actually select the ideal ablation site. After doing that, you have to place the ablation catheter in the chamber and navigate to that region. Many people feel that you can just use the navigation to that site to target the ablation catheter. Actually, the best results are obtained when you look at the electrograms on the ablation catheter and actually select the final ablation site based on the, the electrograms that tell you you're at the site. Of, of earliest activation. So there are a number of reasons that you want to be able to verify the electrogram. And that's what we're going to spend time talking about in this program. I'd like to start by talking about how we actually obtain the bipolar and the unipolar electrograms. And we'll start with the bipolar electrogram. A bipolar electrode is just two electrodes laying on the tissue, on the endocardium, and they will be recording the voltage generated by the wavefront, which will be crossing that electrode. The bipolar electrogram is the difference in voltage 
that's recorded by the two electrodes. To record the voltage, we use a differential amplifier. A differential amplifier has two inputs, one labeled plus or positive, and the other labeled minus or negative. And we plug the input from one electrode into the positive input, one electrode into the minus input, and the differential amplifier takes the voltage in the positive input and subtracts the voltage in the minus input. So the positive input is the dominant input, and so for an ablation catheter, we always want to plug in the tip electrode or electrode one, and then we would put the ring electrode or electrode two in the minus input. By convention, when we have a multi-electrode catheter with four electrodes or 10 electrodes or 20 electrodes, we follow the convention with the distal electrode being plugged into the positive. So we would plug electrode three into the positive, electrode four into the minus, electrode five into the positive, electrode six into the negative, and so on. So why do bipolar electrograms minimize far field activation? Well, when the wavefront is far from the electrodes, both electrodes see approximately the same voltage. So there's no significant difference in voltage. And so when we look at the electrogram, we simply have an isoelectric baseline. And the baseline stays isoelectric as the wavefront moves towards the electrodes until the wavefront gets to about here. And when it reaches a site that starts to get close to the electrodes, we begin to have a difference in voltage between the two electrodes and you get the very beginning of the electrogram. When the wavefront comes in from the direction perpendicular to the electrodes, there's less of a difference between the two electrodes for, for this wavefront. So the wavefront must be closer before there is a significant difference where you get the beginning of the bipolar waveform. And as that wave crosses the electrodes, that electrogram is gonna be much lower in amplitude than when you cross it in the longitudinal direction. But there will always be a small difference, so there will always be a signal. You can place an oval around the bipolar electrode so that a wave coming in from any direction shown by these arrows, will be isoelectric until you reach this oval. So no matter what direction you come into, the wavefront is gonna be isoelectric until you reach this oval. When it reaches the oval, you will get the beginning of the bipolar waveform. So the beginning of the bipolar waveform is not where the wave crosses the electrode, but it's where it first comes into range. And so I like to call the area that's outlined by this oval the recording range, just to specify this is the distance that the electrode can record. The sharp part of the electrogram occurs as the wave is crossing the electrodes. In normal myocardium, you'll see an electrogram that looks something like this with two sharp components. The first sharp component occurs as the wavefront crosses the first electrode, and the second sharp component occurs as the wavefront crosses the second electrode. Now, remember that this electrogram is the difference in voltage between the two electrodes. So the area that is amplified the greatest is actually the space in between the two electrodes. That's really the area that you're looking at with a bipolar electrogram. So this is going to be the area that has the greatest amplification is right at the center of the bipolar electrode. And so when you talk about the location, where is this bipolar electrode? You should always talk about the space between the two electrodes actually as the location of the bipolar electrode. The sharp part of the electrogram, the sharp components, are recorded over a relatively small area, whereas the rounded parts of the electrogram at the beginning and towards the end, those rounded components, they're recorded from a farther distance. So they're recorded in this outer region you could call the far field region. And these would be called the far field components of the electrogram.
So how do we time or annotate the bipolar electrogram? By convention, the bipolar electrogram is annotated to the first rapid component. In other words, that would be the local activation time taken on a bipolar electrogram as the first rapid component. And you actually want to time it to the sharpest part of that component. So it would be the sharpest part of the first rapid component of the electrogram. The sharpness of the signal correlates to how close the electrode is to the source of the signal. In other words, if the signal is very sharp like this, the wavefront is probably traveling right underneath the electrode. Whereas, if the electrogram is rounded, that signal is occurring at a distance away from the electrode. In this example, and I'll show you the electrogram recorded in a moment, the bipolar electrode was positioned in the right atrium, six millimeters away from the tricuspid annulus. And we're going to record the ventricular wavefront as a far field electrogram. Now, just to make it interesting, this patient had a right sided accessory pathway. So the ventricular wavefront was recorded first. Then the wavefront entered the accessory pathway, crossed over to the right atrium. And then we're going to have a right atrial wavefront that's going to travel directly beneath the electrode. So we'll have a far field signal and a local signal to look at the difference. And here is the electrogram. So here is the ventricular pacing stimulus, and this is the atrial potential. And you can see how sharp that signal is, and, and that sharpness tells us that that signal is local or is traveling probably right underneath that electrode. Notice there is a, a small rounded component to that electrogram, and you could even call that a far field component to the atrial electrogram. Well, let's look at the ventricular potential. And remember, the ventricular wavefront is going to be a large voltage, but it's generated, the closest that signal will be is six millimeters away from the space between the two electrodes, which is the main amplified area for the bipolar electrogram. And this is the ventricular potential. And you can see that this signal is not nearly as sharp as this one. It's, it's, it's less sharp. You could say it's more rounded, and that tells us that it's being recorded at a distance. We see a, a fairly large potential because the voltage that was generated is very high. So we don't use amplitude to tell us how close we are to the electrode because the amplitude could be dependent upon really how much voltage is being generated by the tissue. We use the sharpness of the electrogram to tell us it's close. So this would be the near field electrogram, and this would be the far field electrogram. To summarize, the sharpness of the signal correlates to how close the source of the signal is to the electrode. When we look at the size of the recording range, the area that the electrode records, that is dependent on both the size of the electrodes and to an even greater extent, the interelectrode spacing. If we decrease the size of the electrodes and bring the electrodes closer together like this, what do you think will happen to the area that this electrode is able to record? It's going to get a lot smaller. And when it gets smaller, the wave, as the wave comes by, it's going to cross it in a shorter period of time. So the potential, the electrogram, is going to get narrower. More importantly, it's going to get sharper, and it will actually get a little bit larger. Let me see if I can demonstrate that for you. If we use a multi-electrode array with tiny electrodes and very close spacing, we can record multiple electrode distances. For instance, if we record between electrodes one and two, we'll have an inner electrode spacing of 1.2 millimeters. If we record between electrodes one and three, it'll give us an inner electrode spacing of 2.4 millimeters. Between one and four, it gives us a spacing of 3.6 millimeters. 
and if we record between 1 and 5, it will give us an inner electrode spacing of 4.8 millimeters. The following figures were taken from a preclinical study in a porcine model, courtesy of Dr. Alad Anter. This electrode was placed in a dense anteroceptal infarct scar during sinus rhythm, and here you see the electrogram that was recorded with the wide spacing between electrodes 1 and 5. And notice the electrogram has two components to it. The first component is large and a little bit sharp, but not very sharp. And the second component is much smaller, but much sharper. So which do you think is directly under the electrode, or do you think both of them are directly under the electrode? Well, let's now add the electrograms recorded at the different spacing. So here's the widest spacing, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and very close. And look what happens to that first wide potential. It gets smaller as the inner electrode spacing gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. And so at very close spacing, the signal is small and round or less sharp. And so that indicates that this is a far field signal. This is not directly under, under the electrodes. What about the second potential? It's pretty sharp. But notice that as the electrode spacing gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the sharpness actually gets a little bit higher. It's even a little sharper. It's a little taller. But again, the key is in looking at distance. This is less sharp. This is far field. This is very sharp. So this is a local signal, or you could call it a near field signal. And you can see how the difference in spacing allows you to differentiate between a far field signal and a near field signal. So when we look at an electrogram that's recorded with electrodes very, very close together, that sees a very small area and that's what we call high resolution. Now, this figure shows the difference with inner electrode spacing. What if we make the electrodes even tinier? So here, if we look at the bipolar electrograms recorded between the microelectrodes on the Q-dot catheter, for instance, if we record between electrodes 1 and 2 here, between 2 and 3 here, and, and 3 and 1 here, you see that these electrodes are very tiny, very closely spaced, 1.5 millimeters center to center, and place it in a scar again, and now you can actually see this local signal, this near field signal, is very sharp, whereas the far field signal is rounded. So you know this is far field, this is local. Let's compare the electrograms, these bipolar signals, recorded between these tiny electrodes with close spacing to the conventional bipolar electrodes between the large tip electrode and the ring electrode separated by a little greater distance. So we have larger electrodes, greater spacing. So this would be electrode one, electrode two. So this, this would be the bipolar between the tip and the ring and between the proximal pair much farther farther back. That would be back here somewhere, farther away. So just look at the distal bipolar electrogram recorded at the same gain, at the same amplification, that's one millivolt per centimeter, and look at how tiny this local signal is. We know this signal is local from these little electrodes, but here this signal is very small and very rounded and looks somewhat far field. Even if we double the amplification, making this signal a little bit sharper, it's still not very sharp and looks somewhat far field in comparison to the local electrogram. By recording using smaller electrodes, and more importantly, that are very close together, you reduce the area that you are recording from. And not only does the electrogram become sharper, but you are now able to tell a difference in timing between two points that are closer together.
than you'd be able to do with larger electrodes and greater inner electrode spacing. That ability to resolve a difference in timing between two points close together, that is the definition of higher resolution. Higher resolution electrodes really increase the clarity of our maps. For example, in this animal model, this is a porcine right atrial model in which a linear lesion was made along the lateral right atrium, leaving a gap. And the animal was restudied at three months. And after making the maps that I'm going to show you in a moment, here you can see the anatomy that shows the area where the lesions were above the gap and below the gap and the location of the gap. Here are two bipolar voltage maps made in the same animal. The map on the left was made using an inner electrode spacing of 1.2 millimeters center to center. The map on the right was made using an inner electrode spacing of 4 millimeters center to center. Note that the map that was made with the inner electrode spacing of only 1.2 millimeters shows very sharp boundaries or border for the ablation scar and also shows the location of the gap very distinctly in the precise location. Whereas in the map made with the inner electrode spacing of four millimeters, the boundaries of the scar are not quite as distinct and the gap appears to be located a little bit inferior to the actual location. Now we turn to the unipolar electrogram. The unipolar electrogram is actually recorded using the same differential amplifier that we use for recording the bipolar electrograms. So to record the unipolar electrogram, we plug the mapping electrode into the plus input or the positive input. The reference electrode located outside of the chest is plugged into the minus or the negative input. The activation wave is formed when the sodium channels open and sodium rushes in, leaving a small negative charge in the extracellular space at the backside of the activation wavefront. Sodium then rushes up ahead to activate the next cell and the evolving current loop leaves a positive, a tiny positive charge in front of the activation wave. So as activation is approaching the electrode, the electrode sees a small positive charge and you get a positive potential. As the activation wave is moving away from the electrode, the electrode sees the negative charge and you get a small negative potential. When the wave is far away from the electrode, the charge is so small that the resulting electrogram appears to be an isoelectric baseline. As the wave approaches the electrode, it records a steep positive charge as the wave gets very close to the electrode. And as the wave crosses the electrode, the electrode sees the most positive charge going to the most negative charge. And then as the wave moves past, the negative charge becomes progressively less and less, and this is the shape of the unipolar electrogram. And this shape is independent of the direction of the wavefront. I mean, even if the wavefront is moving in the exact opposite direction, the electrode still sees the positive charge as the wave is coming towards it. As it crosses, it goes from the most positive to the most negative. And as, as it moves away, it just sees the negative charge. And so you get the exact same electrogram. So a unipolar electrogram is independent of the direction of the wavefront. The local activation time, or the LAT, is the time that the activation wave crosses the electrode. So that's the time that the wave goes from the most positive to the most negative. And we record the activation time as the, the point of the steepest negative slope. Mapping systems such as CARDO take the derivative of the unipolar electrogram and take the most negative point on the derivative as the crossing point. 
we always record the unipolar electrograms from both electrodes that form the bipolar electrode. So we also get the unipolar electrogram from the second electrode. So what would the wave look like right at this point as, as the wave is moving here for this second electrode? Well, th this wave is now crossing this electrode, so it will be going from the most positive to the most negative, and then as it moves across, it will become progressively less negative. So you see the shape of the two unipolar electrograms is going to be the same, but they will be at a different time. So this is the crossing time, or this is the local activation time for the unipolar electrogram on electrode two, and this is the local activation time for the first electrode. The bipolar electrogram is going to be the signal recorded from uni 1 minus the signal recorded from uni 2. And an easy way to think about that is to simply invert uni 2 in your mind and then add them together and you will get a signal that looks like this for the bipolar electrogram. Well, you might look at this and say, well, Sonny, that doesn't really look like a bipolar electrogram. These two peaks are way too far apart. But actually, it is a bipolar electrogram. So you could say, well, what could you do to make the bipolar electrogram narrower? Well, there are two main factors that influence the width of the bipolar electrogram. One is the electrode spacing. So if you want to make it narrower, you would want closer electrode spacing. And the other is the conduction velocity. So you would want a higher or an increased conduction velocity. So let's take these electrodes and, and move them closer together. If we move them closer together, the wave is going to get to that second electrode quicker, and it's going to bring the two peaks closer together and make it look more the way you would expect for a bipolar electrogram. Well, what about the conduction velocity? Well, if we increase the conduction velocity, then we'll get to that second electrode faster, and that will pull in that second peak. What about filtering? In the EP lab, when we talk about filters, we're talking about the bandpass, which is actually two numbers or two filters. The first filter diminishes the energy in the frequencies of the first number or lower, but it allows the frequencies that are higher to pass straight through, so we call that the high pass filter. The second filter diminishes the energy for the frequencies of this number or higher and allows the lower frequencies to pass right through, and so that's called the low pass filter. Now the low pass filter we usually have choices on our mapping systems or recording systems to select values that are usually in the range of 240 to 500 hertz. And it doesn't matter where you select in there. It doesn't influence the electrogram very much because the energy of the electrograms that we record in the human heart don't have frequencies above between somewhere between 100 and 150 hertz. So anything in this range is not really going to influence the electrogram very well. So typically I pick 500 simply because it's the least amount of filtering there. Now the first filter, the high pass filter, has a tremendous impact on the appearance of the electrogram. It influences or, or can add components to the electrogram that aren't really there. And so for the unipolar electrogram, where we look at the shape to tell whether the wavefront is coming toward us or moving away from us, we want to filter that as little as possible. The lowest setting that we can select on any of our systems is the 0.05 hertz that's used for recording the electrocardiogram. Now, you don't want to go this low. If you go in this range, you will get a tremendous drift in the baseline. The baseline will swing all the way from the top to the bottom of the screen, and it's hard really to see the electrogram at all. So we, we know that you can filter up to around one hertz without affecting 
the unipolar electrogram significantly. And by adding that little bit of filtering, you do get rid of the baseline drift. So typically, you want to filter somewhere in the range of 0.5 to 1 hertz. Most recording systems or mapping systems give you specific choices that you can select and they usually have one of these but often will not have both of them. So you can select either 0.5 or 1 hertz and so you want to use this for the high pass and you can pick anything you wish. I typically use 500 hertz for my low pass filter. Now the bipolar electrogram, you do want to get rid of the low frequency signals because you use the bipolar electrogram to eliminate far field. And far field signals are low frequency signals. So even though by using 30 hertz you get rid of the low frequency signals, the far field signals, you may add additional components to the electrogram that's not as critical because as you'll see further into this talk we're always going to use the unipolar electrograms to select our activation times. So typically for bipolar electrograms we often use 30 to 500 hertz. We will continue with the bipolar electrogram in part two.